before we uh, get started, I'd like you to, if you would, compare for us the more familiar, well-known role of the hospital pathologist with that of the forensic pathologist? Well, both the uh, hospital and uh, forensic pathologist uh, specialists require the same basic medical education and training and uh, procedures, but they differ radically in the approach utilized for death investigation. Hospital pathologists have clinical data at their disposal which they relate to morphological things that they find and the autopsy is uh, performed to verify treatment or uh, diagnosis with an eye towards academic discovery while forensic pathology on the other hand exists outside the realm of the hospital setting often uh, there's no medical history or clinical data that's available to correlate with the autopsy findings and the forensic pathologist must find the cause of sudden, unexpected, mysterious, violent, or medically unattended death with seemingly few clues to death. The investigation which is undertaken by the forensic pathologist is the key distinguishing factor between it and the hospital pathologist. The investigation will hopefully determine who the deceased is, what injuries occurred, what caused the death and when did the death occur and the results may determine guilt or innocence of a person who will receive large insurance proceeds or a host of other issues and there are several other problems where the forensic pathologists uh, deal with and do not confront the hospital pathologist often uh, the identity of victim must be determined and the time of death and injury are always addressed by the forensic pathologist. Determining whether the death was natural or unnatural is a basic function of the investigation by the forensic pathologist and external examinations of the body, cold, death, death scenes and surroundings are all important to the forensic pathologist and all these findings when combined uh, will become important to determine the cause and manner of death. Well now that we appreciate the differences of these two pathologists, uh, can you tell me what is unique about the forensic pathologist? What's unique about the forensic pathologist, uh, you know because of their training in the legal requirements of a successful prosecution as well as their medical background uh, forensic pathologists are uniquely qualified to aid the state in its investigation of violent crimes many times they can identify the type of weapon which was used uh, by examining the surface wounds for example a single edged blade leaves one angle of the wound notched and the other sharp a double edged instrument shows two sharp angles and it is usually possible to determine the entrance from the exit wound by the physical characteristics of the wound. Blunt objects used often leave characteristic markings that reveal the identity from the pattern left off on the skin such as a hammer and damage to the hyoid bone of the neck means possible strangulation. Marks on the neck from hanging often tell about the type of rope or uh, object used and then tiny hemorrhages in the conjunctivae of the eyes or the skin may uh, indicate asphyxia and from these and many other clues the forensic pathologist assists in the investigation and prosecution of those responsible for violent crimes. One crime which the forensic pathologist expertise is essential in we know is the identification and prosecution of a rapist. I'd like you to discuss for us the role of the forensic pathologist in handling rape cases. Rape, by definition, is any penetration, however slight, of the female genitalia by the male without the female's consent and against her will. It is one of the most difficult of all crimes to prosecute because it rests on the question of whether the consent was given and usually only the victim and assailant are present during the crime, leaving the female as the only witness. It is basically her word against his and the forensic pathologist can, however, 
through a complete scientific investigation, offer substantive evidence to help in the trial to determine accurately whether a crime was in fact committed. The forensic pathologist first considered this, the question of whether penetration did occur. Usually, rape includes the use of force by the assailant to obtain access to the female genitalia and penetration. The force used often leaves injury, and when injuries are found in the, say, labia or vagina, they strongly indicate penetration. Other indications uh, are the condition of the hymen, blood clots, hemorrhages, and then seminal fluid present in the vagina is often considered conclusive evidence that penetration has occurred. But it must be noted that the absence of seminal fluid at the time of examination is not unusual either. Interruption of coitus by the male can occur to avoid ejaculation, or the female often feels compelled to wash the vagina thoroughly after the act and consequently, though not meaning to, removes the evidence. Sandy, what about the question of consent in rape cases? Elaborate on that a little bit. Consent is the more difficult component to prove in rape cases. If the female offers little or no evidence, it is difficult for the forensic pathologist to give assistance in the case because the investigation by the forensic pathologist focuses on the physical and not the mental intent. But rape is usually accompanied by violence, and the evidence such as lacerations from the fingernails tend to indicate that penetration was without, content, without consent. Now, there are other indications. Uh, for example, uh, the fingernails may be broken or bent, and debris may be present under the nails from clothing fibers or skin from the assailant, which can also offer evidence. Well, how does the forensic pathologist ultimately positively identify the rapist? To, to positively identify the assailant, the forensic pathologist uses various scientific analyses along with the obvious observations. If penetration of the vagina is complete, there may be evidence of vaginal epithelial cells. Seminal fluid, as we said, could be present and tests relate the seminal fluid to a particular male. Hair is often transferred between parties in rape cases, and the part of the human body where the hair came from can be determined by the m microscope. For example, a special neutron microscope, and the hair can be s identified as the hair of a particular individual. All these enter into the final conclusions which the pathologist must reach in uh, uh, rape cases. But due to the emotions involved, however, and the importance of uh, prosecuting the assailant, the, there must be care in the investigation by the forensic pathologist to ensure justice is reached. Sandy, let's move on to another area. We're aware of our society's changing attitudes in the whole area of male and female relationships, and this has opened up another area closely related to rape in which the mm -hmm. forensic pathologist may play an important role, and that area concerns paternity cases, the identification of the child's father. Could you expound for us a bit upon the important area of forensic pathology as it relates to paternity cases? Yes. Uh, Steve, the ability of the pathologist to positively identify a parent has increased remarkably over the past few years. This is because every human being possesses certain genetic characteristics from the peculiar combination of our genetic heritage which is found in all cells of the body, and therefore an analysis of blood cells would generate the information needed to establish or exclude paternity. One of the easiest and well-accepted approaches to prove paternity is so-called exclusion techniques. Advances in genetic science have led to identification of literally hundreds of genetic characteristics with just a few samples of these genetics, one can attain a virtual positive identification index of the child's father, thus by applying mathematical formulae and techniques. 
it can be shown statistically whether a given adult male is the child's father with very little error. We come now to the discussion of what may be the most tragic occurrences in the history of mankind, the battered child. I'd like you to elaborate just a bit on child abuse as it relates to this topic. Yes, indeed, the battered child is uh, one of the most tragic occurrences uh, in our society. This unfortunate sting on uh, humanity was uh, identified only in 1962 by Kempe and was termed the, the battered child syndrome. And since its recognition, avenues of rescue of the abused child have been established primarily through the legal system. The forensic pathologist often enters the child abuse drama too late to aid the victim who has paid the full price of child abuse through a life of emotional turmoil or even death. Responsibility for identifying the abused child has expanded and today we are all responsible for this. We have been assigned that responsibility by the courts. This expanding role of the responsibility was demonstrated in 1976 California case which involved a physician who released an 11-month-old girl to her mother after an emergency room visit for multiple wounds. The child was su subsequently beaten, burned and severely and sustained permanent damage. Then she was taken to a different hospital and her condition was immediately diagnosed and she was removed from the mother's custody. The child's adoptive parents sued the physician for failing to diagnose, the first physician, for failing to diagnose child abuse. And the court said that although continued beating by the mother was the cause of the child's injury subsequent, the physician was not relieved of liability because the beating was reasonably foreseeable. The physician was found responsible for failing to exercise due care by not reporting the child's injuries to the proper authorities. Well, Sandy, what is the specific role of the forensic pathologist then in this battered child syndrome? The, the forensic pathologist must identify the pattern of trauma. He must differentiate abuse from accident. Now this is a huge responsibility because the decision whether to prosecute a subject often turns entirely upon the pathologist's conclusions. It is hard to imagine a more traumatic and emotional, psychologically debilitating experience than to be falsely accused of child abuse. But it is certainly unjust for a child abuser to be let free to beat a defenseless child again. For this reason, the forensic pathologist has to be certain the injuries are, in fact, the result of abuse. Identifying the child abuser is difficult because abuse cuts across economic and educational boundaries. Some of the common traits, though, of abusive parents include immaturity, self-centeredness, hypersensitivity, and uh, impulsiveness. Well, Sandy, are we dealing here with one type of child abuser, or are there multiple categories? Uh, Steve, we're dealing with uh, multiple types uh, of abusers. Uh, in 1980, uh, Drs. Cyril Wecht and uh, Larkin of uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, conveniently, although somewhat artificially, classified the child abuser into several categories. The first one is the intermittent child abuser. The intermittent abuser periodically batters the child and gives appropriate care between abuse. The intermittent abuser does not intend to hurt the child, but he would feel clearly, he or she would feel clearly sorry afterwards. The children can be identified by broken bones in various stages of repair, and these parents can be reformed and successfully treated in time if the child survives. The second group of abuser is the one-time abuser. It is likely, however, that the one-time abuser is potentially a repeater and is or was only stopped from repeating by killing that child. 
Let me give you an example of the one time abuser as reported by doctors Wecht and uh, Larkin. Would be, say, a 23-year-old mother of two young children who is under the care of postpart uh, of a psychiatrist for un uh, for postpartum uh, depression. Now she appeared that she was fairly stable and was taking good care of her two children. One day while the husband was away, she shot her older boy in the chest and placed his two and a half month old brother in the refrigerator neatly wrapped in a blanket. The woman then shot herself in the mouth with the rifle. What happened to that woman when after her husband left for work to make her behave with such an excess of violence remained a mystery. Now the third type of abuser is the constant abuser. That child abuser deliberately mistreats the child. Many times those abusers have personality disorders and usually are not capable of being uh, reformed. Let me give an example. A 20-year-old father regularly beat his 14-month-old uh, uh, child for the slightest infraction. The mother either too weak to protect or too frightened, reluctantly cooperated with this parental savagery and would care for the frequently moribund toddler until the next infraction. After one particularly harsh beating, the child lapsed into coma and this time did not survive. The parents then concocted an, a, a very complicated uh, uh, thing to dispose of the body and there was even a note demanding $500 in two weeks, and then they buried the remains of their son. The ransom note was discovered, and because of its nature, the local police suspected a hoax. On interrogation, the mother eventually broke down, and between tears told of the child's death and their subsequent attempt to hide the remains in a wooded area not far from their home. And when arrested, the father seemingly showed no remorse. Another category of child abuse uh, occurs when the child is the center of a triangle. You know, many young mothers have live-in boyfriends who often are very affectionate to the children, the girls' children, and they contribute to their well-being and growth. But more often, the child becomes a part of a triangle, emotional triangle. And when resentment builds up in these circumstances, either the intermittent or the habitual pattern of abuse can occur with the woman's children or child being the target of hostility. And here's another example by Dr. Wecht and Larkin. A young divorcee working and going to school developed a relationship with a non-working man who moved into her apartment. The man took care of the child and even was toilet training that child. One morning, while the woman was at work, the the child wet herself and that caused a violent reaction in the babysitter. He chased the child to the bathroom where he shook her and punched her violently and finally she freed herself from his grip and allegedly hit her head against the bathroom sink and died of craniocerebral injury. The young man surrendered to the police. One last category of child abuse is the ignorant abuser. This category is perhaps the most tragic one. The ignorant abuser means well but does not realize the damage caused to the child. They're actually devastated by the harm they cause. Let me give you an example and again by Dr. Wecht and Larkin. A, a young woman learned that pouring pepper in a child's mouth would stop the child's crying immediately. She poured about two teaspoonfuls of pepper down the throat of her whining four-year-old daughter. And on several other occasions, when the child misbehaved, she was quick to apply the pepper treatment. Late one afternoon, the mother poured about a half a cup, Dixie cup, in the child's mouth. But this time, the child became agitated, ran around the house making grunting noises, started to convulse, and died in agony. The frantic mother tried to resuscitate the child, but was unsuccessful. And at the coroner's inquest, the mother was genuinely remorseful, but apparently did not realize the lethal potential of pepper. Sandy, what special problems or dilemmas 
confront a forensic pathologist when they're investigating alleged child abuse cases? The, the dilemmas, Steve, that, that the forensic pathologists confront include distinguishing the abuse from other causes. Because of the nature of the child includes multiple bumps, bruises, lacerations and from accidents, it is extremely difficult for the forensic pathologist to distinguish abuse. But child abuse cases have a number of characteristics that can be revealed in an autopsy. For example, uh, hemorrhages, new and old healing uh, fractures, many internal injuries resulting from extreme force. If the death results from abuse, the state must prove that a crime was committed, that the abuser committed that crime knowingly, and there must be evidence to prove the crime. And the forensic pathologist understands the legal requirements of proof and evidence and can bridge the gap between medicine and law and result in justice. Another sign of the times, if I can use that phrase, is drug abuse and drug-related deaths. The latter especially make front-page news when they involve well-known celebrities, whether it's Hollywood stars or political figures or their children. Could you address for us, Sandy, the subject of drug abuse vis-a-vis -vis the forensic pathologist? Drug abuse and the forensic pathologist, uh, this is dealt with quite often, and over the last decade, there has been a new twist. Due to the large number of drugs that are available, death often results from a combination of drugs and not necessarily from an overdose of one particular drug. And this complicates deaths and makes it even more difficult for the forensic pathologist to interpret the cause of death. And many times, uh, internal and external findings, though nonspecific, and toxicologic studies are needed to determine the cause of death. Uh, some of the studies that can be used by the pathologist includes gas liquid chromatography, uh, thin layer chromatography, uh, spectrophotofluorometry, and these identify the presence and concentration of very minute amounts of drugs if present. And there are other observations that are made during the autopsy that are particular to drug users and abusers. For example, needle marks, uh, scarring, and certain uh, areas of the body uh, can be detected in the drug abuser, and stains on the finger can help the specific drug. Or uh, sometimes uh, one finds some uh, effects of drugs, say, on the nasal discharges. Uh, and uh, congestion, sometimes even pulmonary edema from uh, various problems. There may be presence of, uh, say, uh, viral hepatitis from the use of needles. And the forensic pathologist ascertains the presence of the drug not only in the blood but also in various parts of the tissues and determines what has contributed to the drug through use or abuse of the drugs. Sandy, our discussion uh, to this point has covered really only a few of the examples of the role of the forensic pathologist. Perhaps in the, in the conclusion here, you could share with us just some final remarks about the Quincy type and his peers. The uh, Quincy uh, is important, uh, has given quite a bit of uh, insight as to what the forensic pathologist uh, does. Uh, but you know, uh, one area where law and medicine interface is forensic pathology. Here we are dealing with individuals that uh, are going to study those crimes or those mysterious uh, types of deaths, rape, questions of paternity as we discussed, and child abuse and drug abuse, uh, among others. And the forensic pathologist is, plays a very important role. Nowadays, uh, the forensic pathologist is uh, becoming even more specialized. We have the breed of forensic uh, pathologists who have not only the MD but also a law degree, 
and some of the forensic pathologists may be practicing both their medical as well as legal professions. And the forensic pathologist is generally a highly energetic, ingenious, and uh, really special person who, after careful examinations, can offer opinions as to cause of death in a particular case that is backed by scientific conclusions and, say, in the case of paternity cases based on genetic evaluations and, as we talked about, child abuse by special testing. So here, the forensic pathologist has that unique ability to bridge law and medicine.